<laughs> What's going on everybody? It's Friday. Now, that makes it a big day for a few reasons. So let me go ahead and go through them first. Today is the start of the Strongsville show. Now, I'm recording this before I left, but I can tell you it's going to be a really exciting weekend. I'm going to try really, really hard to post at least one video of the show. We'll see about two, but I, I mean, the, <laughs> I'm not sure how much I'm going to be sleeping. Taking a red eye in on from Thursday, uh, landing early, early Friday morning, which is today. Uh, when you're watching this, it's it's uh, it's going to be interesting, but I'm super excited. I'm mostly excited to see a bunch of my friends who I've not met in person. And that is without a doubt my biggest uh, thrill of this weekend. If I pick up some cards, great. Is it possible that I could not pick up a single card at the Strongsville show and consider it a success? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Now, I brought money. I'm planning on buying some stuff. I am I would be shocked if I don't buy something. But even if I don't, this is going to be an awesome weekend. Now, I will say that Monday is usually my uh, viewer response uh, video. That's going to be doubtful. I hate to cancel. I hate to be that guy. I'm very consistent about my videos. I'm not saying for sure I've got to cancel, but the fact that I'm I'm going to be getting home on Sunday and then I'm going to be on the Four Collectors uh, Strongsville recap live stream on, on Sunday night, there's a very good chance that I'm not going to be able to knock out this video uh, for my Monday one. But stay tuned just in case. Just wanted to throw out that warning. Also... Today's the deadline for the March pickups. If you want your favorite pickup from March to be included in the Midlife Community Show and Tell, uh, today is the last day to submit your favorite pickup. So in the description below, there is going to be a link to a Google form. It will ask you some questions and give you a spot to upload a picture of your favorite pickup of March. That will be coming out uh, sometime next week. So uh, very excited to see all of those pickups. I never peek early. I wait until the end. So I have no idea what's in there yet. I have no idea how many submissions there are. My hope, my goal is that we get 100 submissions this month. Last month, we were at about 80. So that's my goal. Will it happen? We'll have to see. Now, enough of that. I have been talking recently about a channel that I am a big fan of, which is uh, Vintage Sanctuary. Uh, Adam is a great guy. Uh, we have texted a lot. We have talked once, and I'm really excited for our conversation today. Now, when I think of his channel, when I think of his collection, his collection I really think about I Appeal stuff. He's, he's a very particular collector, um, he's a very patient collector, and he's got great eye appeal in the cards that he adds to his collection. Uh, he collects mostly vintage, obviously with Vintage Sanctuary, but he does collect some vintage players in modern cards as well, which I think will probably come up in our conversation. So uh, I'm literally recording this right before I head in to talk to him. So uh, I'm expecting a great conversation um, I'm expecting a lot of fun. Um, leave your comments down below about what you think of the things that we end up talking about, um, what you think of the conversation. And if you haven't yet, I would highly recommend uh, subscribing to Adam's channel. Again, Vintage Sanctuary. So let's go ahead and take a look. Here is our conversation. All right, so here I am. This is the conversation I've mentioned a few times on the channel. I've been looking forward to it. A uh, really great guy, Adam. Uh, again, highly I encourage you to check out his channel, subscribe to his channel, Vintage Sanctuary. Adam, how you doing? Awesome, Greg. Thanks for having me on. Of course. I've been looking forward to this. And, you know, we've been kind of texting about it for a couple of weeks, but we finally got it locked down. Uh, I leave. I'm Well, we're recording this on Wednesday evening. And then it'll post on Friday. So everybody listening, 
uh, happy Friday, uh, but uh, I'm getting ready to leave for Strongsville. So we're, we're getting this in right before I take off for that. So you're not, <laughs> By the time you're not people, going to go ahead. By the time people watch this, you'll be in vintage heaven. So I, I hope so. I hope so. I'll, <laughs> at, I'll at least be hanging out with a bunch of really great guys. So that part, I'll definitely am, am excited uh, for, and then the cards will just be a bonus. So, um, you know, you're not going to the Strongsville show, but you've been to the national. Um, and you know, what's, what's kind of, you're just, give me a couple of tips before you're going into a big show like that. What is your, where's your headspace? Like what, you know, as a, as a vintage card collector, do you make lists? Do you get comps? Do you just go in with an open mind? Like what is your, what is your kind of, what's your strategy? Yeah. Okay. Well, the 2022, uh, I have a background in coin collecting. So I sold a couple of, uh, you know, coins with substantial value at what I would call the last minute. Like it was maybe a month or so, or six weeks before the 2022 national in Atlantic city. And it was very expensive to go from the West coast uh, to Atlantic City. So I made this decision to go kind of at the last minute. And I didn't know anyone in the YouTube community yet. You know, I was just starting to get connected because of some YouTube videos. And so I showed up at the National on Wednesday night, uh, not having met anyone yet. And I was totally overwhelmed. Like I had been to card shows before, but and coin shows, but you know, just the size of it. And, and I think it was a combination of the size of the show uh, I uh, can connect with people, I think, relatively easily. I'm outgoing in that regard. However, um, change can be kind of challenging for me. So, you know, I had made this commitment at the last minute to go all the way across the country. I'm not a big flat fan of air travel. And so, you know, and it was a lot of money. And so, like, what in the heck am I doing? And plus, uh, from the coins that I sold, I had a decent amount more cash than I would almost ever have to spend on something, you know, at the Nationals. So, I'm there and it's exciting, but at the same time, I'm like, what in the heck am I doing here? So I was so overwhelmed, Greg, that I said, I'm just going to, in order to try to kind of simplify the situation, and I had not met anyone yet, I'm just going to look at 1952 Topps Willie Mays cards. And oh. that was what I was hoping to get, but I didn't know if I could maybe afford a one or not with the cash I had with me. So I literally just went around almost in the days uh, looking for in the showcases, 52 tops, uh, Willie Mays cards. And, uh, then, you know, a lot more happened in that show, but let me say one year later on Wednesday night at the 2023 national in Chicago, now I'm connected with some people, you know, yada, yada. I was still overwhelmed on Wednesday night. And I was like, I was a little bit shocked. Maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was just so overwhelmed. So I imagine this year on Wednesday night, even though I have more connections and more friends now, you know, and I'm looking forward to meeting you and there and meeting others and seeing others for a second or third time, who knows? I'll probably be overwhelmed on Wednesday night again. <laughs> but uh, for 2022, I tried to simplify it by uh, focusing just on the 52 Tops Willie Mays and seeing if I had enough money to find one that I liked. And, you know, I've shared that story that worked out really well. In yeah. 20 so, so let me let me yeah, share that story yeah. in case nobody caught it is recently on one of my videos it was talking about picking up a grail card and so adam talked shared the story of he picked up his authentic psa uh, willie mays and he he really wanted a numeric grade and so he ended up submitting it to sgc and it ended up getting a two and a half right and there is that beautiful card right there. So yeah, so it got the two and a half. I mean, that's a pretty that's a pretty sharp, clear two and a half. You, you know, mean, other yeah. than the off center, other than the off center, it's really really nice. I think so. Yeah. So yeah. So when you went to that twenty twenty two show, you were just kind of all on your own. You didn't really have anyone to meet up with and you just kind of did your thing is that i had i had planned to uh meet some youtubers i knew i was going to go to the thursday night youtube meet and greet i okay. figured you know, wednesday night or thursday during the day i figured i'll probably run into some youtubers i didn't really have a lot of phone numbers i had mike baseball collector but 
I didn't want to bug him because he's, you know, plugged in and he's connected to so many people that uh, I was a little bit shy about, hey, Mike, I'm here, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I happened to run into him that Wednesday night, though. Uh, he was, I think, the first YouTuber I ran into on the show floor. And as soon as I saw him, I said, hey, Mike, would you go look at a card with me? Because I had already found the authentic Willie Mays. So he went over there with me. And it turns out he knew the dealer. It was this guy, Mike, from MM7, Mickey Mantle number seven uh, sports cards out of Oklahoma. And he had drove to this guy's shop to pick up his uh, 51 Bowman Mantle rookie. So he had an established relationship with this guy. So he ended up negotiating for me, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, the price was $2,750. And I was thinking, uh, you know, I'd like to get it for maybe $2,500 if I could on the authentic. And uh, it's interesting because Mike just started negotiating for me and got it to twenty five hundred. But what I thought was funny is he never, you know, he never asked me. I guess he just kind of assumed, you know, I'm going to buy this thing because I had said, "Hey, come look at this with me," which is all good. I mean, he knew I wanted it, but it's kind of funny. Yeah. He just, you know, jumped right in and started negotiating for it. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but I'm That's unhappy funny. about that. It was, it's so all a good. year a year later, you go back to the national in twenty twenty three, and now you probably know a lot more people, right? Now I know some people. In fact, Dylan and I had arranged to room together. So that was really cool. Dylan, Double D Vintage Baseball Cards. But I was still overwhelmed on Wednesday night. And um, I, I had an open mind as far as what I wanted to get. I had sold uh, some coins. And so I had a decent chunk of change. And I was hoping to get something big. Um, you know, I kind of wanted a a 51 uh, Bowman Willie Mays. But I knew it was really, it was out of my range, you know. Uh, I think I was just kind of thinking, well, who knows, maybe. But I realize now it was just out of my range, and I kind of wanted, wanted a 52 uh, tops Jackie Robinson. That would be another card. And it was out of my range. Now, I saw one there that I could have gotten, but it had uh, this pretty grody tape on the front on, like, three of the four corners. And I, I knew I just couldn't get past that, that if I bought the card, you know, I, I wouldn't – that would bug me. So I passed on that, and I ultimately ended up that Wednesday night I saw the um, the 1938 Gaudi uh, with cartoons, Joe DiMaggio. And uh, I said, I'm pretty sure I want that, even though it's a one that has some issues. So I went back on Thursday, uh, you know, early on the sh in the show on Thursday and went ahead and got it. And I will say this, if you're looking for something where there's a lot of demand for it, uh, I recommend trying to fi find it and buying it on Wednesday night uh, or maybe Thursday morning, but preferably Wednesday night. Because if you're looking for something like, let's say, a 38 Gaudi Joe DiMaggio in a one, there might be at the national, you know, I mean, I'm sure it'll vary by the year, but there might be two or three of those on the national show floor. But if they're at a decent price and they have decent eye appeal, I, you, you better get it Wednesday night, I think, or maybe Thursday morning. Even then, it might be too late. Wow. Okay. So you have it there. Oh, so he's shown his 38 Gaudi, uh, DiMaggio in a one. And again, I mean, you say it has some issues. It looks pretty, looks pretty nice looking <laughs> to me. I mean, it's got you know, a pretty, this... Go it's ahead. got a really nice looking surface. I mean, the color on it is clean. It doesn't look super dirty. Some of those older cards, you know, right? Pre-war cards, they get really, really dirty kind of dirty and that one that one doesn't look like that you, you know here's the deal and i will admit i'm pretty picky it's probably i'm guessing an average one although maybe it's a little above average since the further back we go you know the more beat up cards tend to be but it's got plenty of corner wear it's uneven it's got some scuffing it's got wrinkles it's got toning it's got staining it's got a little paper <laughs> loss on the back it's got so it's got all sorts of little issues that I noticed, but you, you know, and to be open about it, at first I was like, can I live with, with this? Because it does have a lot of issues. Now I absolutely love it. I've made my peace with it. And I think it ultimately boils down to, um, it really depends on the card for this card. A one was, you know, pushing my budget. I think I got a great buy on this one and, uh, there aren't too many, you know, of these around, uh, and the low grade ones are, if they look decent, are going to get snarfed up pretty quick, especially if they're not priced too high. So this was kind of a, you know, I get a one or I get a none. And so I right. decided to go 
with one rather than none. And so I, I'm super stoked about it now, but it was an adjustment period for me because uh, I didn't have any other cards with, you know, those level of issues. But I'm really stoked about this that I think, you know, mentally I was trying to get there, but emotionally I believe I've gotten to the point where it's like, yeah, this this is wonderful because, uh, you know, this is the best I could do uh, probably for sure for this particular card. And I really wanted this card. I mean, if this were, you know, this were like a 58 tops card or something, uh, I'd be looking for a better condition, but it's not, it's a 38 Gaudi Joe DiMaggio with cartoons. So I'm super stoked. So that, I mean, what you're saying is kind of brings me to one of the things I wanted to talk about with you, which is you're, you, um, like you said yourself a minute ago, you're kind of picky and, you know, uh, you talked about the 52 tops, um, Jackie Robinson a second ago, and you said, you know, the tape just, it would have bugged me. It, it would have driven me crazy. So I just couldn't do it. Um, but also it sounds like realizing sometimes you have to, if you want a card at all, you're never going to be able to own it unless you own it at a certain, with a certain amount of issues so that, you know, because of the price point of those, those bigger cards. So I guess my question to you is, what are the things when you when you're looking for a card, whether it be like you just mentioned a 58 or a 59, you'd want in higher condition. Let's say if you're looking at a card in 58 or 59 versus you're looking at a, a Grail type card like a 38 Gaudi uh, Garrick or a 52 Tops Willie Mays, what are the things that you look for that? are like deal breakers or it must haves like what would that Gaudi have had it sounds like tape on it would have been too distracting so that's that's like a that's a death sentence to that potential purchase right but uh maybe a wrinkle isn't or maybe rounded corners aren't so how do you kind of break down from your your self-proclaimed pickiness what is acceptable and what is not acceptable? And it sounds like there's probably different answers depending on the price point. But what's kind of your philosophy on that? Yeah. So uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, is there anything that distracts me that I'm not going to be able to probably get past, uh, you know, emotionally or mentally, or I'm going to be fighting with myself to get past? Like generally I know pretty quickly now it can be tough online, right? Because online you don't always see all of the, the, you know, issues with the card, but generally I know pretty quickly there's either something about that card that bugs me. I mean, to give an example, let's say that it's, it's, you know, uh, maybe a pre-war card or something. I don't have a lot of pre-war, but let's say there's a little bit of kind of toning. Well, if there's a little bit of toning and it's not too distracting and it might even enhance the eye appeal by giving it that wonderful vintage look. Hey, I can live with that. But what if one corner is toned pretty dark and the others aren't? Well, now your eyes kind of drawn to that corner, you know, that might help me. And so I might just pass this particularly since most of the cards I collect uh, are not rare. So I can wait for one to come along that, you know, where I like the price, I like the look. A uh, wrinkle wouldn't necessarily bother me, but it really does depend on the size of the wrinkle and exactly where it's at. I mean, you know, generally speaking through the face is, is problematic for sure. Um, so I guess, um, well, let me give you an example to help yeah. out a little. Bit. So I had a Hank Aaron rookie card that I bought online, a PSA one that looked gorgeous. And when I got it and when I reached out to the seller before I bought it, And I said, why is this a one? Because you couldn't tell from the pictures. And he was never up front with me. Uh, So, but I took a chance and I bought it and I couldn't return it. You know, the whole eBay authenticity guarantee thing. And it was a no return. Anyway, it was was like a sine wave. It was uh, warped. And when you looked at it straight on, you really didn't see that warping. But uh, the warping was just bothering me. And so I have a philosophy. It could even be Hank Aaron's rookie card, which was a grail card for me. And it's like, I don't like the thing. I'm going to sell it. You know, I yeah. tried to make my peace with it. And I'm like, I just don't care for this. So I sold the one. And when I sold it, I had it at a pretty high buy it now uh, bet or best offer because it had a nice eye appeal, uh, despite the uh, the waviness, the warpness. And the guy who bought it for me, he reached out and said, it looks gorgeous. What's wrong with it? And I, I told him exactly, hey, it's got this warping. You look at it straight on. It looks perfect, but definitely warped. And uh, he was happy. 
So I took the proceeds and then some more money and bought this uh, this 2.5, which people have told me this is one of the nicest 2.5s on the planet. It's centered. It's pretty sharp, you know, the color, yeah. no wrinkles, no snowing. It's really nice. Now, this is yeah, a car. Right. There's lots of these around. Now, they're expensive, but there's lots of them around. So a card like this. I was going to wait and be picky. So I basically bought this card when it just screamed by me. If a card screams by me, then I take that seriously, you know, and yeah. I will make it happen if I can. Now, I had kind of set that money aside from the PSA one, but I was like, all right, I can, you know, sell a coin or two or, you know, I can go into a little hobby debt. It's not a big deal. It's like I have a monthly budget. And, you know, I can spend more. I'm just spending into the future. So, uh, you know, this card spoke to me. I really went after it. Um, but for pre-war, for something like the DiMaggio, you know, for something like this, I'm going to wait until one uh, really appeals to me. The most important qualities for me would be uh, the color, the the vividness of the color, the freshness. I don't mind a little off center. I'll take a fresh looking card that's a little bit off center over one that's centered, but there's there's some fading or there's some snowing or there's some surface issues that I can see. So that's me. Now, I don't want crazy off center, but I'll take a little off center. Uh, I prefer, if it's going to be off center, I prefer it to be off center top bottom as opposed to side to side, because I think that's not visually as detrimental, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a little bit of corner wear is fine. Uh, to, to me, it's really, it's really, um, you know, it depends. Like if the centering is wonderful, but there's a little corner where that can compensate. On the other hand, if it's a little bit off center, but the corners are sharp, the colors are vibrant, that can compensate to me for a little off center. Um, but the deal breakers would be tape generally, uh, any wrinkles that are, any wrinkles or surface issues that are, um, that are distracting to me, uh, fading, that's a deal breaker. Um, toning that is, uh, kind of a toning that's uneven and blotchy that, you know, a little bit of toning that sort of maybe, you know, even enhances its vintage appeal, that's fine. But toning that's uneven and distracting or blotchy, um, too much of a diamond cut, too far off center, um, you know, these are things that could, could, uh, would generally cause me to pass on the card. But with the, with the Gaudi Joe DiMaggio, because of its age and because of its expense and because those get really expensive you know when you start looking at sharp and vibrant and centered uh i was willing to give quite a bit the deal breakers there would have been some it actually has a couple of wrinkles that go into his face but they're they're very they're like these very minute factory wrinkles so you don't even see them so i can live with that on that card but um uh i mean they're pretty minuscule actually but uh you know if there were major wrinkles if uh tape uh just some big distracting blotch or something, anything that would distract me and cause me to say, that's going to bug me, then yeah. I don't care how great of a deal it is unless I'm just flipping it. I'm going to pass because I would rather put my money into something that I'm going to really love having and enjoy looking at. Now, I, I mean, I think that you covered that really well on, on the things that are the, uh, you know, this is not okay. This is okay. You know? And I think to me, I think the thing that resonated the most is uh, the issues that you mentioned to the point of distracting, like once it gets distracting, if it's a stain that's distracting, if it's a corner that's distracting, if it's centering, that's distracting, if it's toning, that's distracting. It's like you, you want the focus to be the card, not to be the problems with the card because every card has problems. It's just whether those problems take away from your attention from where it should be, which is the card. And and I think that makes a lot of sense. Now, something I've, I've heard you talk a lot about that you were a coin collector and that you've sold some coins um, to buy cards. And, you know, for people that aren't coin collectors, you know, there, there is a lot of similarity between coins and cards. You know, there's a lot of the grading and, and there's a lot to it. But I've been curious, why have you moved out of coins and into cards? What, what, what made that happen? And why is it now I'm going to liquidate that and buy this instead? Like, what happened? 
Yeah, it's a combination of things. I would say uh, one factor is it seems like there's a more robust card community. Now, in fairness, I think, you know, there are some coin com communities, communities people could get involved in and they could really get plugged in. But it seems like uh, it's pretty easy to find the more uh, robust card community. And in the coin community, uh, at least from what I saw, it was uh, more some pretty deep pocket coin collectors, which is cool and fine. But, you know, uh, that wouldn't necessarily be my forte. I mean, I couldn't get into a a club where they're spending, you know, $10,000 on a coin because, uh, you know, I just would be priced out of it. So right. I'm really seeing the same community. I'm not saying it's not there, but I, I wasn't really seeing it. So there's that. Yeah. Also, yeah. coins tend to be smaller. And they tend to be monochromatic. They're basically one color, you know, whatever metal they were uh, uh, minted in. Mm -hmm. And so uh, visually, I don't think they display nearly as nicely. Small and monochromatic. Really, the way to really enjoy a coin, you almost have to look at it with magnify magnification. Whereas these cards, uh, vintage or modern, they're larger, they're colorful. I think they display really well. So there's that. And then also with the coins, like if you go back to something like, say, uh, the Morgan dollars, because the engraver was uh, George Morgan, which uh, also sometimes called Bland dollars for the Bland Allison Act, uh, because really the silver industry was subsidized by these, uh, you know, gov these uh, government uh, laws that were passed, causing us to uh, create all of this silver coinage, a lot of which just sat in treasury vaults. But anyway, these Morgan dollars went from 1878 to 1904, and then a last hurrah in 1921. And then there were several mints. You got San Francisco, New Orleans, Philadelphia, Carson City. I think that might be about it. Oh, and also Denver in 1921. Anyway, out of these Morgan dollars, uh, granted, depending on what mint and depending on what condition they're in, they can have more luster and so forth, and they can have, they can have colorful toning. So they can absolutely look different. But basically, you're talking about the same essential design from uh, 1878 to 1904, then in 1921. You've got your scarce or rare date mint mark combinations like 1893S, um, you know, and then you've got your commons like 1881S, but they all look essentially the same. So, you know, if you collect uh, that set, if you collect one of each date and mint mark, uh, yeah, they'll look different because of toning and the amount of wear and so forth. but you're looking at a hundred and some coins that are all essentially the same image. What's changed yeah. is the date and the mint mark. Whereas that with cards, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I kind of got on a kick for a while where I was collecting some uh, Morgan silver dollars as well. And, and they're gorgeous coins. They're absolutely gorgeous. And for me, it wasn't so much about needing them to be in a particular condition. It was just, I don't know. I just, they were just cool to have and cool to handle and cool to look at. But I had, I had wondered that. Um, now when you're looking for cards, so back to cards for a second, yeah, when you're looking yeah. for cards, I heard you say once, and, and I've watched a fair amount of your you on channels and things. And, and I don't remember where I heard you say this, but I heard you say something one time about just staying patient and sometimes you just need to wait and sometimes you need to just pass on this when the right one's not there and i know that for some of us myself included it's really really hard to stay patient and there there come times where i get i feel like i'm in a rut and i'm like man nothing new has come in lately that to the collection because i haven't seen anything and the cards didn't come up and then and then the one does come up in the grade that I can afford in a look that I like, and then I don't win it or I don't get it or the deal doesn't happen. And you just get, you just get discouraged. Like what advice do you give to somebody like me? Who's not a patient person? How are you able to do that? Yeah. So I would give the, first of all, let me just uh, admit, which is maybe obvious. I don't know. I feel the tug of that as well. You know, I think it's, it's challenging to, to be patient to be disciplined because let's face it, we like to buy stuff and we like to add to our collection. I would say uh, the secret to patience, I've heard this before and I believe it's true. The secret to patience is doing something else in the meantime. So how does that 
relate to collectors. Let's say a collector, for example, let's say the only thing they're collecting, I'm just going to narrow this down. The only thing they're collecting is uh, the 38 Gaudi with cartoons, the 24 cards with the cartoons, and that's it. And they're on a somewhat limited budget and they have certain criteria. Maybe they don't care about corner wear, but you know, they're looking for, for the color to be nice or whatever. And what they want is not coming up that often. Well, yeah, that can become discouraging. It can be really tough. If you have enough interests, though, if you have enough different areas where you're seeking cards, then uh, within a month, you may have to exhibit some patients, but within a couple of weeks or a month, if you're searching uh, auction houses, et cetera, there's a pretty good chance something will come up that uh, that is in one of your wheelhouses that will meet the criteria you're looking for. So I think that secret of, to patients being doing something else in the meantime is that, you know, maybe you'd like to add a key 1953 tops card to your collection, but you'd also like to add a certain T206 card to your collection, or there's several among the T206 you might want. And then, you know, maybe there's uh, a 70, some 71s top, tops cards that you're looking for, or some 52 Bowman, or maybe, uh, you know, maybe some Tiffany cards you're looking for. You've got several areas you're searching. There's a pretty good chance that something will come up you get stoked about in one of your wheelhouses, one of the areas that you're. Okay, in. so so this is bringing me directly into one of the things that I wanted to pick your brain about too. There's a really fine line between having too narrow of mm. a collecting interest for the reasons we just mentioned, and having it be so broad that you aren't making really a lot of progress because you're being pulled in 30 directions <laughs> yeah. and what yeah. you, and you're there's no focus. So if if I were to look at like your eBay saved searches or if I were to, you know, kind of pick your brain on like what's the breadth of what you're looking for right now, what does that look like? Are you a Hall of Fame collector? Are you a good because I've seen you, your chant, and I'm gonna I'm gonna interject a little bit more. You know, you have everything from you know you just displayed three huge awesome cards, right? The the Hank Aaron rookie, the Willie Mays 52 tops, the 38 Gaudi uh, Dimaggio. But I've also seen on your channel, you know, uh, a lot of really nice like early Bowman. Um, you know, you call them Yankee contributors, where they were really good Yankee players, but they aren't necessarily Hall of Famers, and they're really good players. And and so I've seen you collect that. I've seen you show some of the new shiny stuff. I mean, I just watched a video of you last night about your trade with, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> our buddy Shuag Legend, and he, he about about some Aaron Judge cards. So it feels to me, watching your channel, like you've got your hand in a bunch of different areas, what is your, what is your focus? If you were to describe your focus, yeah. what is your focus? Yeah. All right. I'll do what I can. Cause you've probably already figured out I'm long winded, but I'll try not to get too crazy with this. Oh no, no, you're good. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, let me just say that I try not to get too many focuses, too many areas. Uh, because there's a part of me that desires to cut down on the number of directions I'm heading in so that I'm able to give the directions that I am heading in some attention. And there's also a part of me, I guess you could say that somewhat of a minimalist that, uh, you know, would like to have just a few focuses and really focus on those and not have such a huge collection, you know, uh, less cards, but uh, more quality, if you want to call it that, that yeah. I can really enjoy and appreciate. But having said that, there's also something really cool about branching out and experiencing some different areas. So, you know, I'm wrestling with that, I think, probably like so many collectors where I'm trying to find wherever my balance point is between, you know, experiencing all these different areas and having a tight focus. When it so comes where to are you? So, yeah. So where are yeah. you right now? Are you in the area where you, you've branched out in too many places and you need to cut some of those branches? You need to do some pruning? Or are you in a spot right now where uh, you don't have enough? Like, where are you right now and where yeah. have you been? I think I'm in a pretty good spot. 
And I will say that the reason you saw some big cards is as I was selling some coins and I had some basketball cards from the past and so forth. Uh, and during the pandemic, I was able to uh, make some really sweet profits just selling some stuff that I had, you know, like a lot of people were able to. So I went after some of those bigger cards like the Hank Aaron rookie and so forth. And then converting some coins. I went after some of those bigger cards thinking, let's get those first because that'll set me up if I want to do like a Topps Willie Mays run or a Topps Hank Aaron run sometime down the road. So my collection is not as big as it seems because, uh, you know, I went after some of those big cards on purpose. I only have six uh, Willie Mays Topps base cards, but three of those six are 1952 Topps, 1953 and 1954. So I, I've set myself up for the run nicely, I think. Mm -hmm. Let me where I'm at with modern. So just recently, I got into modern a little bit and I, I had been resisting it. I felt a call to do something in modern, but I didn't want to uh, dilute my efforts too much. And so I tried multiple times to get a Aaron Judge rookie card. And I would go onto eBay and I would look at all of these different Aaron Judge rookie cards and I would get overwhelmed and, and give up. I kid you not. It's like, oh man, there's so many of them, you know, it, depending on what you want to call a rookie, right? But from his rookie year. I finally got excited, and I think Shane, Shoebox Legends, and Dylan Double D Vintage Baseball cards got me excited about the 2022 Tops and 2022 Tops Chrome Aaron Judge number 99 because that's kind of the you know the base Tops card from the year where he he did this totally epic thing: the 62 home runs, American League home run leader, breaking Roger Maris's 61 year old record, the natural single season home run king, you know, probably. So. Uh, I thought, yeah, I want to get versions of that card. Okay, so I'm trying to keep my modern collection tight. I'm now just branching into modern. I want to experience some sort of a rainbow because a lot of people will say, oh, modern sucks because, you know, they make a gazillion versions of every card, right? I want to experience that, but I only want to experience it with versions of this card right here. This is the Independence Day where I traded Shane for, for it. So this is the out so of he's, hold, he's holding up the 2022 tops Aaron Judge, which there are a, a wide variety of parallels of it, and he's holding up the Independence Day uh, parallel, and uh, he did a video on this recently. So uh, when you go and check out Adam's channel, a Vintage Sanctuary, one of the first videos, one of the most recent ones you're going to see is him talking about this trade that he did with Shane shoebox legends, which again is he's another re I mean, I don't know him at all. I've never talked to him. I've watched his channel for about the last month and a half. Seems like a really, really good guy. If you've not checked out his channel, shoebox legends, check him out too. Um, I'm sorry. I just, sometimes no, I have okay. so many people that I know stream and just listen that I want to describe what you're holding up so that they can kind of enjoy it, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. So for modern, I've restricted myself to uh, versions of the 2022 Tops Aaron Judge base card. I thought, how cool would it be? And I have not shared this on a ch on my channel or anyone's channel, so I'm gonna share it right now. So maybe some people wouldn't care, but I'm 60 years old, turned 60 on January 29th. So in a couple of years, I'll be 62, and I thought, how cool would it be when I'm 62? to have 62 or more versions mm. of this card from the year when he hit the 62, the epic 62 home runs and became arguably, well, I don't even know if it's, if it's that arguable, the single season uh, natural home run leader. And I love Barry Bonds. So, you know, I've got Barry Bonds cards too. So it's no, you know, I can have both. I can have both. Yeah the enhanced home run leader and the natural home run leader and be stoked how about many it. how many parallels are there i mean if you're saying you're going to get 62 of them how many are there yeah. do you know you, you know what's kind of crazy and you'd think as as a math teacher mathematician that i would have went out and checked i almost like not knowing i'm pretty sure there's more than 62 <laughs> Yeah, And someday I may look it up, but at least for the moment, I'm kind of enjoying not knowing. It's almost like this unknown, you know? Mm -hmm. So, But I feel pretty confident there are more than 62 when you start looking at, you got the UK, you got Japan, you got, you know, I'm not expecting to get any one of ones, but you've got, you know, several that are out of 50, a lot that are out of 199, you know, a lot that are out of 99, a bunch of those, you got a whole bunch that are, that are unnumbered, yada, yada, yada. So right. I, 
quite confident there's at least 62 that are attainable. So I think that'd be pretty cool. All right. So, all right. so let go ahead. And let me say a little bit more. So I'm trying yeah. to keep my modern collecting down to, I was trying to keep it to two areas and I just got into modern. So most of my spending recently has been modern uh, versions of the Aaron judge and um, modern Willie Mays cards that are some gold version out of 50. Like this is his uh, 2020 Allen and Ginter uh, gold uh, serial numbered out of 50. So modern Willie Mays out of 50. I I will admit this. I'm going to admit now. I try. I'm trying to keep to those two things for modern. And look what I did. I haven't shown this yet either. Uh -oh. I bought the darn. 2023 tops Aaron Judge Independence Day. So I I broke my own self-imposed rule because I'm I'm like this card is so darn awesome. You got the yeah. the patriotic Yankee logo and the the stars all around. So so I broke my own rule. I'm like, well now I guess I'm collecting base Aaron Judge Independence Day cards as well. <laughs> you know, and that's for me. It's such a slippery slope. And so I've been trying to hold back as much as I could. I bought a modern card recently. <laughs> I bought the the Derek Jeter card where Mantle and uh, George Bush are airbrushed into the background, and you know I just thought that was such a cool card because you know there there are so many there are some very memorable moments that those two also contributed. So it's almost like the ghosts of those two guys, even though George Bush is still alive. Um, so let me let me pull you back into vintage for a second. So if you are, you know, because a lot of a lot of uh, vintage collectors, I think a lot of people are are considering going into vintage or starting to go into vintage. A lot of the comments I get are, hey, I just started collecting vintage or you've convinced me to get into into vintage. If you, over your journey over the last you know few years, as you've really started to get out of coins and into cards, what would you what advice, what learning curve advice could you give to some of those people about maybe um, what to collect, what what grade or quality to collect, what things to look for? Like, because that's a that's a very common question I get is I'm new to vintage. Um, you know, what about this? What about the SGC or PSA? Uh, grades six and above or or grades one through five, like collector grade or investor grade, you know, um, I appeal or or grade number. Like, what would your advice be to somebody kind of um, starting to go into that vintage realm? Yeah. So my advice would be, first of all, I think we're all going to uh, grow and change as we gain knowledge and experience. And it's impossible for us to know. I try to take kind of a Zen approach to this, which I have some idea about where my collecting is going, but I'm not trying to force it because I don't know how I'm going to grow. It's like a wet bar of soap. If you hold it too tight, it pops out of your hand. If it, you hold it too loosely, it slips out of your hand. So my yeah. advice would be don't spend too much. Just just start looking at cards, you know, whether, you know, online, there's so many resources. Start looking at the different sets, read about some of the players find out who you like in terms of the beauty of the cards or, you know, what's appealing to you? What starts to, to call to you? Is it the beauty of 53 tops cards because you love those painted images? Is it the beauty of 53 Bowman cards because, you know, they're the kind of the first epic color photos? What, what is appealing to you? Is it the history of pre-war? Uh, is it a certain era where that history just really appeals to you? Is it a certain player? Start finding out what appeals to you and then try not try to spend not too much to start with. Like if Ted Williams appeals to you, maybe you start with some 59 Fleer Ted Williams because, you know, you can get some of those uh, without spending much at all for sure, especially if you go ungraded. Or heck, even some near mint to mint eights of a lot of the cards could be, you know, 50 bucks or less, maybe even 40 or, or less at auction. So don't spend too much. And, and try to buy stuff where you can get most of your money back or say all your money minus selling fees, like generally buying at au auction, you know, you can do better than uh, buying, I've heard you say this as well, than buy it now, although you can always negotiate and sometimes do, you know, close to as well or about as well as auction. But, you know, try not to spend too much. Uh, 
spend at a price so that if you want to turn around and sell that, you have a good chance of getting all your money back minus the fees. Because as you grow and change, you might find out you have a bunch of cards you want to move. Well, if you didn't overspend for them, you'll be able to move them and you know maybe get 80% of your value back after fees, assuming the market on those cards hasn't haven't changed if those are cards that are in demand. So try to buy stuff at a price, try to buy stuff that has some demand at a fair price so that you can get most of your money back when you do decide to change direction, because you probably will as you grow and learn, there's gonna be stuff, early purchases that you wanna uh, trade or sell in order to get something else. So don't spend too much to start with and buy stuff at fair prices that you can liquidate when you decide you wanna get something else. I think that's such good advice. And I think I think you point to something that a lot of people overlook. And what you pointed to was your interests are probably going to change. So, because a lot of people say, I don't care what the grade is. I don't care, you know, if other people like it, I'm going to buy what I like. And I do, but I do think you should buy what you like. But if you buy what you like and nobody else likes it, you know, and then you decide, I like that more, you're not going to be able to liquidate this because, you know, it's... <laughs> I use analogies. I love, by the way, I love that bar of soap analogy. So an analogy is this. You buy you buy a house on a busy street because the, house, the busy street doesn't bother you. You're totally fine with the busy street. But then when you go to sell the house, nobody wants to buy your house because it's on a busy street. And you don't understand why nobody wants to buy it. Well, it's the same reason you got a great deal on the house for the busy street. So maybe you don't mind tape on the corners of the card, but other people do when you try to sell it. So I do think it's important to be cognizant of what other people like, even though you shouldn't collect for them, you should at least consider if I were to move out of this, how hard will it be to move out of? And, you know, a lot of people say, Greg, you know why you you are all about PSA and SGC. You won't look at some of these other holders, and it's like it's not that I'm necessarily against the old other holders. It's about the liquidity. If I decided to move out of the card, so I think that that's a really good point. Now, you know, with with that in mind, let me ask you this follow up question. Another comment people make a lot is old cards are going to die off with all the old people. Nobody's going to care about, you know, Joe Tinker. Nobody's going to care about, you know, these, uh, you know, Johnny Mize. They're not going to care about these guys that even if it's into the 50s, like a Johnny Mize or all the way back to, you know, almost the turn of the century with, you know, Tinker. It's like, what do you think the future looks like? Because if, we're, what we're saying is you have to kind of care what the future looks like of the card because you might want to pivot out of it. What What is your response to the people who say that those old guys, those old cards, nobody has seen them play. Those cards are going to die off when the old guys die. What's your response to that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to say just a little bit about modern and then I'll pivot to vintage to address your question. Okay. So like some people say, hey, modern cards, you know, they might be some of them are lower serial numbers, but they print a gazillion parallels. It's just totally out of control. You know, they're not going to have much value. We'll check this out. The 2022 Allen and Ginter gold Willie Mays out of, serial numbered out of 50. I paid $15.50 for this. Now, I don't know what it grade, probably eight, nine or 10 because it looks really nice. But here's the deal. This guy's still a living Hall of Famer. He's arguably the best all-around player ever. This is an absolutely gorgeous card. It pairs well with vintage. Uh, $15.50. Am I going to get hurt on this card? I mean, hey, maybe at some point if I decided to sell this, maybe I only get 10 bucks. I'm not going to get that hurt. But I tell you what, I've already had more than $15.50 worth of enjoyment just owning this stunning beauty, you know? So if somebody's spending 300 bucks for this very card in a PSA 10, yeah, I'd be concerned they're going to get burnt. But 
15 or 16 bucks for an absolutely screaming gorgeous gold Allen and Ginter Willie Mays, who's still a living Hall of Famer. I, I'm I'm uh, feeling pretty bullish that if I decide I want to sell or trade that, uh, I'm going to get my 15 bucks back in the future and probably more. Right. Now, having said I, that, I, yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Keep going. Even if I don't, I think that card's freaking cool. So even if you know, nobody wanted it in the future and I just had to give it away to somebody, although I have no intention of getting rid of it. I've still had well over 16 bucks worth of joy. So I'm already in the positive. Now, having said that, what about these older players? They will always be loved. I mean, short of some sort of apocalypse, but if apocalypse happens, then, you know, all bets are off. They will always be loved. <laughs> Why? Because uh, because they're fantastic players and they're a part of baseball history. So people like me who knew nothing, I didn't know Johnny Mize existed a few years ago. Heck, a few years ago, I know, knew so little about vintage baseball. If you just said, have you heard of this guy named Mickey Mantle? I would have said yes. Willie Mays, I would have said yes. Uh, Hank Aaron, I would have said yes. Uh, I'm pretty sure a few years ago, if you said, have you heard of Ernie Banks? I would have said no. Uh, Eddie Matthews, I would have said no. Um you know, Frank Robinson, I would have said no. So I didn't know about these players. So people will uh, gravitate toward vintage, not all collectors. They'll gravitate toward vintage. They'll gravitate toward the superstars that that appeal to them, like uh, Mantle, Mays, Hank Aaron, and so forth. But if those are too expensive, or if they just uh, want to go after more players, then they'll start looking at people like Eddie Matthews, uh, Johnny Mize, you know, some of these... Uh, awesome Hall of Famers that have wonderful stories that were fantastic players. The 1946 Propag uh, Propagandas Montiel, Los Reyes del Deporte, Johnny Mize in a pristine one. This thing is so gorgeous. That is a nice looking card. Uh, I And I got this for less. There might be three of these on eBay right now. And I paid less than what they're asking for all three. And this one is much nicer. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm grateful about that. But, yeah, I fell in love with Johnny Mice because I was like, this dude, I think it was 1947. He had 51 home runs and he only struck out or if maybe it was, yeah, 51. I think he struck out maybe 42 times. Don't quote me on that. But he struck out. He was He's the only player who's ever hit 50 home runs and struck out less than 50 times. And he was a big guy. They called him the big cat because if you brushed him back with a pitch, he was just cool as a cat. He would just kind of move out of the way and he didn't even move his feet. He just got right back in the batter's box. Like, you know, you're not, you're not going to shove me out of my spot. You know, just like this guy is really cool. I didn't know about him a few years ago. Now I'm like, I can't get enough of him. And I think that future collectors will do the same. I, I love I love the answer. I, I love uh, I love I love the enthusiasm. You know, it's like there, there's when when you turn on your YouTube feed and and you're looking through different channels, and everybody brings something to the table, right? We all we all have something about our channel that might turn people on, might turn people off. You know, I'm sure there are some people that find me horribly annoying, and there are some people that find me wonderfully entertaining, and. One of my favorite aspects of of your channel is the enthusiasm. It is an infectious enthusiasm, and uh, and you displayed it quite well in that response. I've got, I think, one more question uh, for you that I'm I'm super interested. We've been going for about fifty minutes. Uh, I was thinking it, we would go it for feels about like five. <laughs> I know it really does. It really does. It, it, it uh, I, I said, well, maybe we'll go about four. My wife said, how long will you be? I go probably about 45 minutes. And here we are at 50. And I have at least one more question for you that I don't necessarily think is going to be a short response. So um, this is <laughs> you already no, know no, not, not just because I think it's an intriguing question. Um, but so so here's my thought. My my question is, it's something that I, I commonly wrestle with. It's something that I've talked about recently on my channel. Um, it's a topic that's come up. It, it came up, you know, I, I did a video the other day and, and I, I led the video with your recent 52 Bowman Larry Doby, which is a beautiful card. And I'm on and it, I my kinda, Yeah. And, and I went through and, and I'm looking at these two cards side by side and I'm like, man. 
it, it really feels like we're buying the grade, not the card, not the eye appeal. Now, I totally understand that PSA and SGC, they, you know, especially PSA, they they have like a rubric. They have these technical scores. You're like, does it have any wrinkle? Okay, it can't be above this. You know, if it has this centering, then it brings it down this many points. And then it equates to some sort of grade. And, and so I totally respect the fact that there might be a card that gets a six, but it doesn't look as nice as a different card that's a four. But if you look at it under a loop, then the four looks better than the six. I totally respect that. And I'm not trying to say that the PSA or SGC grading systems are flawed. I'm just saying that the way they look at cards is different than the way that collectors look at cards. So why are we paying the amount for how a card looks under a jeweler's loop instead of how the card looks to our raw naked eye? And so my question for you is, looking forward, do you think, and this is a question that I, you know, I asked on my, on my channel recently, how do you see this playing out? I mean, th there, was, there was a time not that long ago where, you know, Beckett was, was the top dog in grading. Not, I mean, not that long ago. And now th they're, they're trying to hold on in survival. And so things can change quickly. What do you see the future looking like at collectability as far as grading versus eye appeal versus pop count versus what do you what do you think that's going to look like moving forward? Yeah. So believe it or not, I have some thoughts. <laughs> First of all, this is in uh, the double D frame. In the double D frame, I won from my good friend Dylan. And it is the glorious, this thing is, is a, uh, a gem mint 4.5 and the back is just as nice. It's beautiful. So, okay, here are my thoughts. So for those who are doing a high grade set, now that could be a high grade of modern, like for example, the Aaron judges that, that I'm getting, uh, you know, I have been getting some that are ungraded. Maybe I'll get them graded. Time will tell. But I'm kind of hoping, I'm kind of thinking probably the way this will play out is everything I I get, I want to be kind of 8, 9, or 10, just because, you know, it's modern, should be able to find it in those higher grades. Um, anyway, I'm not looking to put it on a registry. But for those who are doing a high-grade set, either it could be a high-grade vintage set, and they're doing it for the PSA registry. And when I say high-grade, maybe they're looking to get 7s or 8s or just as high as they can. They've got a mix of 7s, 8s, 9s. They've got deeper pockets. Well, for them, uh, I don't think the future changes for them. They're going to keep working on their set. They're going to keep going for their 7s or 8s or 9s. Here's where I think it will change and already is changing. For those of us who, for vintage cards, often play in the grade range of, say, 1 to 5 in many cases, Right now, and I know I mentioned this in a comment, I'm just ballparking it. Right now, the market might be 85% the number on the holder and 15% eye appeal. There's exceptions to that. But I think in the future, the market will be a different percentage. Maybe it's like 70% the number on the holder and 30% eye appeal. So in the future, and I think it's already begun, uh, there'll be greater premiums for eye appeal so that I could see uh, in some cases, an absolutely gorgeous, okay, here's what's going to happen in the future, Greg. Everyone's going to want this card right here. They're going to want my 48, 49 Leaf Stan Musial in a PSA, in a pristine PSA one because it's got a pinhole. But other than that, the registration is spot on, which is tough. It's fairly sharp. The colors are screaming gorgeous. So in the future, I predict everyone's going to want my copy of this card. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, so I could see a time when, you know, not just because I own this card, but I could see a time when a card like this uh, sells for more than a three that, uh, you know, has some obvious wear for a three. Because even though this is a one, I could see a time when collectors say, you know what, the color is vibrant, the, the uh, registration is spot on, which is not easy on this card. The corners yeah. are pretty sharp. 
It's a little bit off center down, but not bad left to right. It's got a pinhole. That's what's holding it back. I could see a time when for cards like that, uh, somebody might spend more for a, a one like that than they would even for a three that's got some corner, corner wear, a little toning, uh, maybe not quite as vibrant. I think uh, the equation is already changing to where, uh, in my opinion, as a general rule, the grade will be the largest determiner of value, the number. But I think as time goes on, the eye appeal will get a higher percentage of the value equation. Now, if you listen closely, you can hear all the way from New Jersey, Mookie Chilson giving you a standing ovation <laughs> to your <laughs> high <laughs> phrase of pinhole cards. He is absolutely, he's doing the Arsenio Hall fist pump thing 100%. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I get, I mean, what you're saying makes sense to me, you know, and, and, and again, nothing's going to beat the the eight with the sharp corners and the clean surface and centered. And, and, and that's always going to be, that's always going to be the best, but the three or the two or the one and a half or the one, that's a really nice looking card, but has some sort of technical flaw that knocks you a whole bunch of points off versus the five that has, you know, 98 two centering and uh a, you know uh some sort of uh print marks across his face or, or print lines like the 50 and 51s have all these print lines on them and it's like i don't see people wanting the the yogi berra 51 bowman with print lines straight across his face in a five instead of the the two that is perfectly centered perfect colors but it, it has a surface crease on the back like i just don't see people preferring that it doesn't make any sense to me and and it sounds like we kind of agree on that but ultimately it doesn't really matter uh you know you, you do have to buy what you like but like we said earlier you have to also buy what you like and hopefully it's not you're not the only person so if you do decide to liquidate it there's someone to liquidate it too, right? But let me show you. I know we're probably pushing time, but I, I would like to show another card here. Yeah. Uh, this is the 54 Red Heart Dog Feud Food, blah, Stan Musial. Now, here's the deal. Oh, it's a a beautiful a premium card. For this. Beautiful yeah. card. Th this is a four. And why is it a four? Well, before I show it, let me say a little bit. The back's, you know, a bit off center, which is almost always the case with these Red Heart Dog Food cards. That doesn't bother me a bit. The front is centered. There's a tiny bit of corner wear, but not much. I mean, pull out your magnifier, right? It has just the lightest bit of toning uh, because the, uh, you know, the edges are not as white as they could be. And in my mind, it actually enhances, enhances the vintage appeal of, the, appeal of this card. And some people could say, Adam, you're just going to say what you're about to say because you own this card. I don't think so, but maybe. In my opinion, it's actually better than a 10. So the centering is, you know, could not really be any better. The presentation yeah. could not be any better. It has just the slightest bit of toning that I think just, you know, makes it an absolutely glorious vintage card. I'll show the back. The back is a little off center, but that's almost always the case with red hearts. And nobody cares about back centering. Uh, maybe somebody does, but almost nobody. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, if that were a 10, could it look nicer? Well, maybe someone would think so. I don't think it could. I really don't. I think that that is a wonderful example of what we're talking about, um, where the technical score comes down, but the actual look of the car is high. I, it's fun for me, too, because, I mean, I've seen all these cards that you're showing I've seen on your channel. Um, except for the one that was a new pickup of the judge. And it, it's uh, so if if you're listening right now, again, I, I would recommend uh, subscribing to Vintage Sanctuary. Uh, Adam has this energy all the time. He loves showing cards. So if you're a, a person who likes to see the cards that people are talking about, you know, he's he does that a lot. And I've seen you can check out all these cards with uh, and it. I totally agree. And and I think that that 
you know, and, and last thing I'll say is that red heart card. I, this is one of the things I love about YouTube is if you were to ask me five years ago, Hey, the 54 red heart stand usual, I would have said, I don't know what card you're talking about. Like I would have known about the red heart cards, but I wouldn't have known about that card. But like one of the things I do on my channel is I'll ask questions to the audience. And one of them one time was, what do you think is the most beautiful card of all time? And all these cards came onto my radar that were off of my radar because people were saying them. And one of them was that card. And and that's the beauty of this YouTube community is like you can learn so much just from listening. You know, it's like the old saying. And it's like you can learn so much just from listening. And that's one of the reasons in in my channel and one of the reasons that I have you on right now is because my channel's not about me. My channel is about the hobby and it's about this community of people. And I am well aware that a lot of people out there know a lot more than me about a lot of different aspects of this hobby and of different cards that I'm unaware of. So one of the things I try to do is I try to tap into that resource of everybody by trying to get information from others like hearing about cards like that like hearing about you talk about what are the things that you can't get past and you talking about how you approach a card show and you talking about you know the things that you look for and why you collect some of the modern stuff and and like i i genuinely like you were saying a minute ago you're like Greg, you know, uh, I, I know I, I like to talk and I get long winded. It's like, no, I love it. I, I, I'm asking these questions because I want to know what you're saying. And so I love listening. So um, I've had a blast. Uh, I've learned a lot from you just in this conversation. Um, and I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate your time. Hey, I know you're a teacher. I know that, you know, we're, we're we had work today, <laughs> you know, and but uh, I really had a good time, and I hope that we could do this more often. Yeah, yeah. just a couple of quick closing remarks. Uh, one thing I'd like to say is, you know, if somebody has a card, for example, like the 54 Red Heart Dog Food Stand Usual, and if theirs is, you know, if theirs is uh, off-center or has some, you know, fading or wrinkles or wear, all sorts of issues, I will still share in their their joy. So I'm not saying that, you know, everyone's 54 Red Heart Stand Musial is supposed to be well-centered or is supposed to have a certain look. All I'm saying is this one really spoke to me. And when it was on an eBay auction, uh, you know, I bid up for it, hoping to win it. And I was fortunate to have the funds and be able to do so. So uh, I'm not suggesting by any means that, you know, everyone should collect the way I collect. And the other thing I want to say is just thank you so much, uh, Greg, I really appreciate all of your kind words. And, uh, you know, you've given me some shout outs and that's definitely uh, increased the number of people coming to my channel. So I'm grateful for that as well. So uh, I appreciate your friendship. I'm looking forward to getting to know you more. And uh, I appreciate all of your kind words. And I appreciate you having me on uh, this uh, episode as well. So I'm really stoked. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everybody out there. As always, I genuinely love hearing your thoughts. I know Adam would be interested in feedback on things we talked about too, your opinions. And and again, you don't have to dis you don't have to agree with me all the time. Like I'm gonna be wrong. I'm gonna have opinions that you don't share. Just like Adam, I mean, he made a great point. You know, there are there are just because he collects a certain way doesn't mean that's the only way to collect. You know, if Adam and I were friends in college and we went into a college bar and there's this room full of uh, people, you know, and uh, I might approach a different gal than he might approach, right? And that doesn't mean that the gal that I'm approaching and my first pick is is better than his or, or inferior to his. It's just a different eye appeal. And it's okay to have different eye appeals and our eye appeal can change. So I think that I think that again, that's a great point. That just because you collect one way or I collect one way doesn't make that the only way. That's part of what makes things interesting. Just like if we all rooted for the same football team, it wouldn't be very entertaining to watch football games, <laughs> yeah. right? So for sure. <laughs> with that, thanks again, Adam. Uh, check out his channel, Vintage Sanctuary. 
highly recommend you subscribe to it. Once I subscribed a few months ago, I watch every episode that he puts out, and I think you will too. So thanks again, Adam. Thank you.